Hello. Um, I'd like to introduce the second uh, session. But before I do that, I'm just just um, have a really quick reflection on the first session. Um, the questions and issues raised in the first section is tremendous, and I think it's really um, going to lead us into the, the rest of the day. And in fact, I would like to share um, a couple of very quick stories with, relate, with regard to why it's important to continue um, searching and asking um, questions of methods, the how-to, and what exactly is an archive. As an architect, a historian, and also a woman, in the last few years, I have had uh, multiple chance encounters in which this question of being a woman repeatedly in different ways um, gets foregrounded. So let me just cite two. And the first one was, um, again, a collaboration, one of the many really productive collaborations I've been have, uh, Hong Kong U uh, Architecture and M Plus have been having. And this was one in which, uh, to go back to Li Yu's point about the pioneers, it was a uh, oral history um, project on uh, pioneer architects in Hong Kong. And I was tasked, um, together with Shirley, to interview uh, James Kinoshita, who was, um, uh, uh, since he has since retired, but he was once a, um, a partner at PNT. And uh, it was a very fascinating conversation at the Kinoshita's residence. But what struck me, um, other than a really uh, lucid and uh, fascinating conversation with James Kinoshita was actually um, the in-between conversations with Lana Kinoshita, who is um, the lovely wife of James Kinoshita. And um, during one of the breaks, uh, uh, Mr. Kinoshita told me that uh, actually, would you be interested to see my wife's portfolio? I said, your wife's portfolio? And so I said, of course. And so he took out two fat, black portfolios and begin to, and this was completely unplanned and unprecedented, to go through the work um, that his wife, Lana Kinoshida, did for um, 10 years in which she was an interior designer. And she was one of the first uh, interior design um, office that she set up in her namesake um, uh, out shortly after her graduation. So this, um, started me promising Lana that I would uh, begin to look into who are the others like her who had worked with architects, who were themselves architects, or who had to deal with architects um, in which uh, issues of their gender in some way or another were foregrounded. Because the story of uh, Lana um, is not untypical to many. The reason why she did, uh, she only spent 10 years in interior design is because she um, then decided to raise uh, three very lovely children um, in which she focused all her full-time attention. Another story, and then I promise I'm gonna get to Julia and um, the, the vision and also to introduce the session, was an encounter with a filmmaker who has since, uh, from Singapore, who ha is now a really well-known um, local Singapore uh, filmmaker who, whose both her parents were architects. And uh, d two years ago, I had met with uh, Bin Bin, Tan Bin Bin, who said that she, growing up, had never known what her mom worked on, but she knew every single project that her dad worked on because her dad set up his own office uh, in a very well-known um, complex that was uh, one of Singapore's very few mega structures built in the early 70s called the Golden Mile Complex. And her mom, on the other hand, had worked in various government uh, departments designing schools and had um, told her daughters that she had designed countless schools and public facilities. But and everywhere they drive in, uh, across the island, she would say, oh, I did that, I did that. But never once was it um, her namesake because it's always a collaboration. So to return to questions of uh, the question of methods and archives, I think what you're going to see in session two, three, and four are uh, a variety of things, including the kind of collaborations, the mentors, the opportunities, um, the settings, um, and of course also the kind of types of um, um, architectural practice. But what tie everybody together, um, from Minette to Joan Lin, our last um, 
uh, guest uh, participant today, is that each and si every single one of them is very sensitive to the context, um, not just professional, but cultural, um, fit, um, built environment context, uh, physic um, um, the geopolitics, um, the variety of per interpersonal, emotional um, situations in which they are practicing. So, um, and I could share more, uh, countless of these, but um, it is with such uh, encounters that I felt very, very compelled um, in talking to Shirley earlier this year that we have to have this conversation, not just to talk about women in architecture, but really also to talk about architecture and the city. So session two, titled Thinking, Writing, and Building, Mediating Architectural Publics focuses on addressing architecture beyond building and highlight the important contributions of women as editors, writers, researchers, and curators, of course many of them also architects, through publications and activities. Um, and specifically we will also um, uh, contextualize it to Hong Kong um, with activities, many of which were hosted by the Hong Kong Institute of Architects. T um, but first, I will introduce um, uh, the magazine Vision, as well as um, another magazine, through the eyes of um, Julia Fung. So I would like to introduce the various participants in this panel. This is a very unusual panel because the two speakers um, are not physically present uh, with us. So the two interlocutors, myself and Thomas uh, Chung, uh, associate professor at uh, uh, CUHK, we will be having a conversation in a phantom manner with um, Julia and Corinne. And you, uh, you will see the phantomness of this very soon. Um, but very quickly, first, I'd like to introduce Julia. Julia is an interesting figure because she's the only one uh, today on uh, the stage who is not an architect and not um, trained in any fashion in architecture. However, she was, um, and this is a um, poem that she wrote in 1974 um, when she was 18 um, and has since 10 years ago um, expanded, and uh, for because of time, I'm not going to be able to read the entire ex expanded uh, uh, poem. But it's called Ode to Knowles. And for those of you who know um, Hong Kong, you Knowles is the architecture building, as well as one of the um, uh, vice chancellor of Hong Kong, you at a point in time. So what is Julia, who's not an architect, who um, spent not more than 10 years writing and interacting with key architects and architectural thinkers in Hong Kong to do it with this conversation, um, I'd like to begin by sharing with you um, how through the figure of uh, someone like Julia, and not just her, but really the woman editor and writer serving as a conduit in which we can begin to understand and um, the situation and also a particular moment in Hong Kong, specifically in this case, 19, late 1970s and early 80s uh, Hong Kong and its architectural situation. So we were 18 in 1974 and the um, whole poem talks about life at, um, at Hong Kong U. But more specifically, it, um, the poem deals with um, and reflects a, an 18 year old who is extremely sensitive to the context in which she is in. Having come out of um, uh, being um, part of growing up in the tumultuous 1960s in Hong Kong and the region and being um, uh, one who could enter what she called the elite uh, institution of Hong Kong U. Uh, moving on, um, Julia then um, serendipitously um, joined because she graduated in Hong Kong U from psychology and sociology and um, her uh, initial job was to join a uh, publisher. And the publishing press was very much at that time called Thompson Press, uh, putting out a variety of journals, two of which she was, uh, um, one of which she was very much involved in, and another one was one that she co-founded with the, uh, um, with 
the key personnel that had departed from that. And I'll very quickly run through this. But what I want to start with is um, this article, Jumping Forward, uh, in 1980, called Women in Architecture, A Budding Romance. It's fascinating because I was thinking while reading through this article, which essentially is a conversation pretty much between Julia and then new um, head of department, Eric Lai, at the University of Hong Kong. And essentially, it was someone who is coming from the lay pretty much the lay, not architectural field, asking very pertinent, fundamental questions about the profession. I'm going to read very quickly one or two of them. And she said, um, in Hong Kong, only 20% of the graduates um, in the university turn out every year are women. Actually, that's quite uh, surprisingly not that few in the 70s. However, she said that only 5% eventually enter the profession. And to date, only 20 out of a total of 477 institute members are women, and none of them has yet been elected council member. So what is the truth, she asks, about existing conditions for girls who want to enter the profession? Something that, if, uh, that I would not ask because I would assume that's uh, a, a non-issue. But however, um, she asks, are they given equal opportunities to pursue the necessary training leading to eventual professional recognition? Without dwelling on this piece, essentially that's the tone of the piece where um, fundamental questions were posed and um, uh, key members of the professions were asked this. What's interesting is, and again, uh, this photo of Minette, who in 1974 had just begun teaching at Hong Kong U. I think she was about, uh, actually she started teaching, I believe, 74, 75, until 1979. Um, and so what Julia had done was to also seek out a number of, that is um, uh, um, um, another uh, Hong Kong architect um, who, then she began to seek out and look at what the work they were doing and the issues they were encountering. What are the factors that have hindered the full technical and expressive achievement of women architects? Um, do women confront more professional problems than their main counterparts? What are the interrelationships between women's roles as consumers, produ sorry, producers, critics, and creators of space? So what she's saying here is not just a question of the women architect, but the role of women at large. Why has architecture, which is part art, part business, been so universally identified with the men when the activities it involves are far from strictly masculine? When I started this project and um, uh, to really answer the kind of questions that uh, we all didn't think that's important to us, yet they are fundamental. Uh, many architects of, um, uh, of the same generation as Julia would feel that it is a non-issue, that why would you want to single out myself as an architect, uh, as a woman architect? just talk about my work as um, an architect. So it's interesting and perhaps uh, not surprising that it has to come from outside that question and that uh, curiosity. So if we zoom out again, which is something I think um, to go back to what Tariq was talking about uh, in terms of the cultural context uh, and the lateral understanding of um, where this woman um, uh, and women architects and architects were operating. Actually, in, uh, throughout the 70s and uh, in the early 80s, other parts of the world, and um, here I single out a few, uh, MIMA, which is a journal that was um, funded by the Aga Khan um, and uh, focuses mostly on Asia, South Asian um, architectural uh, practices and, uh, and um, situations had also in his second in its second in um, issue um, in 1981 focus on the question of women in design and here um, it is noteworthy that Brian Brace Taylor, who was the writer and editor uh, of this journal and also writer for this piece, um, and it wasn't a woman. So uh, kudos to Tariq, who actually uh, was uh, drawing attention to this. And he had begun to, um, in a way, uh, in a curatorial fashion, started to collect uh, and uh, draw attention to the work of contemporary uh, female architects um, practicing in this time across Asia, um, from Pakistan to Bangladesh um, to um, Iran, um, Lina Bobadi, in uh, Sao Paulo, um, Pravina Mehta in India, and to 
kind of draw attention to the kind of work that they were doing, either as individual architects or collaboratively with partners. So, um, uh, and this, um, this has, uh, was already mentioned earlier in, by uh, Li Yu of um, another contemporary event that was happening in um, Taiwan. And in, in many uh, ways, Taiwan in this region did take a lead in the, uh, in the 80s um, in terms of having an event like this. Because what we're having now, which is similar to the event like that in 2019, uh, is the first one. So. Um, comparatively, that was over 25 years ago. Um, and so um, a symposium on architecture and women in which um, I, uh, um, Wang Laoshi had also sort of participated in and shared reflection. I will not go back to the quote, but um, that uh, was already read. Um, if we go back a little bit, because Hong Kong is very much tied to um, what is happening in the UK in terms of professional development and so on, the REBA had spent an entire issue in the uh, mid-1970s looking at every aspect of the woman from um, the woman architect, from the woman as user, from the view of the woman student um, and woman in practice, um, uh, this is just a small selection, to really kind of um, initiate this. So it's actually not surprising that, um, that uh, Asian architect and builder uh, also picked this up. Um, to return to uh, um, Julia Fong, both uh, I would say in an interesting way, um, compared to the other um, architects we have today, she's really more an interlocutor, I would say, or facilitate, perhaps, facilitator, uh, perhaps. And so at the same time, not just architecture, uh, at the point in Hong Kong and the region when interior design was about to become an actual pro um, profession, um, she was also very much in the thick of the action. So a number of articles she wrote, um, this one, uh, and she always have uh, very interesting titles to them, uh, which essentially is also the statement of her piece, from ordinary to mediocre, as a kind of uh, ironic, perhaps, because what she was trying to say in this piece was that it's about time interior design um, is uh, brought to awareness as a profession. And uh, in another piece called The Ailment and the Cure, again, it's a kind of uh, somewhat uh, ironic or paradoxical uh, situation where she uh, presents the um, various kind of uh, uh, interior projects done by women or um, uh, men, um, interior designers and architects, in which she said that there is a rising pr uh, profession and it's not just decoration and we need to kind of uh, um, draw, uh, kind of take that seriously. Then, uh, as part of uh, the kind of ongoing writings about that, a particular issue in which uh, in the Far East Builder um, Journal, where she showcased, very similar to the piece um, earlier in 78, where she looked at the various women interior designers and their work in vibrant colors. Um, so why vision? This is interesting because the uh, key persons of um, the Asian Architect Journal, of which um, Julia was a part of, she was really hired fresh out of graduate to write and help edit for that journal. Um, and she was brought out together with, uh, with a core team of um, very uh, sort of um, uh, inter, uh, in, um, of thinkers and architects, specifically um, Tao Ho, um, David Lung, Eric Lai, and Suresh Shama, who was the main editor for the journal Asia, uh, Far East Builder and Asian Architect um, and Builder. So Vision became actually and was the first journal in Hong Kong to focus and in, both in its title um, and also in its contents on architecture and design. So design as a kind of foregrounded as the issue, not just architecture 
S building, but architecture S design. And uh, I just want to read very quickly the um, statement of vision and why it's called vision. We believe good architecture will slowly but inevitably find its way into Hong Kong and change its tarnished concrete matchbox image. Vision will not only mirror that process of creative evolution, but also accelerate it by stirring the imagination of architects and designers through visionary ideas, inspiring examples, constructive criticisms, controversial debates, and academic discussions. We hope to be part of a design revolution which we think is long overdue. Vision has a very short life. It lasted um, uh, five years, uh, less than 10 years, five. Um, it lasted just about 28 issues, I think. Um, and uh, and uh, Julia was involved in the editorial of the first 25 issues. Um, what was uh, particularly um, noteworthy is um, that it, despite its short existence, it attempted to do what it stated in 1983 in its first issue, which is to have conversations. And so um, I'm just going to draw, um, uh, I'm just going to share uh, a few that in which uh, um, Julia was again taking the role of the questioner or the um, interviewer. This particular one was to focus on um, the question of practice. So she was um, asking um, leading architects at the time um, in the early 80s, the, um, how is it like? What is practice like? And uh, how do you actually practice in a city like Hong Kong? And so um, a whole range of interviewees, including Rimo Vera, uh, Riva, Graham Campbell, uh, Messling, Zhang Ng, um, Tao Ho, uh, were part of this conversation. So, um, and it was specifically and directly called uh, interviews with architects on controversial issues. And being in a position where uh, the stakes are very different for someone who is not an architect or in architecture, she could ask these difficult questions. Two other things in which uh, that was involved in, that she was involved in, and in which Vision become the platform to showcase this was um, in uh, April 83 with the announcement of the winning entry by Zaha Hadid. This, is, um, this particular uh, competition is significant on a, on a few levels. One, it was, it was the first um, uh, competition in Hong Kong that, that was run by a private developer that was actually um, uh, part of a private enterprise, not a public competition. Second, of course, it was won by a um, woman architect. Uh, and Vision was uh, featured a full extensive um, interview uh, and uh, with not just um, the architect, but with the jurors, with the jury panel. Um, and so this is kind of uh, an extensive conversation about that as well as the jury report. So. Um, and uh, again, uh, taking the role of the interlocutor um, and uh, participating in this conversation. So I just want to kind of really quickly draw this to, I keep uh, seeing that uh, my time is almost up, it's up, um, that this is the last issue of Vision in which Julia was involved in. Uh, subsequently, there are a number more, and for various reasons, uh, Vision uh, um, concluded its run. But uh, what I want to draw your attention to is that what is interesting is that there is a phenomenon across. If we look at, for example, um, in magazines that were produced, uh, the, uh, the publication by Siam, uh, by uh, acoustics and other journals that came out of the 50s that were active in the 60s and 70s, we always see and I'm not, I do not want to overstate this, but that we always see quietly somewhere in the background an editor who's taking notes and um, listening in. And we hear that uh, Jacqueline Tewitt, um, who was the um, always sitting next to Siegfried Gideon and Luca Buzier, and later on uh, with uh, um, uh, Constantino Doxiadis, um, and uh, also the one who draw attention to Patrick Geddes in India. Um, and um, we see that repeatedly. So while we, I do not want to overstate the role uh, of the woman who often uh, just historically get written off as the secretary or as the kind of just an editor, but uh, and doing the job that nobody wants to do, which is to edit what architects say, which is the 
we're staying <laughs> is a very difficult job. And, um, and to kind of sort of round up uh, what uh, my sharing today with um, the last bit, uh, if anyone would like, I'm sure Julie would be happy to share her ex very extensive poem, to kind of foreground that architect or not, um, this is an individual who is at one moment in time involved in a very particular moment in the architectural history of Hong Kong and at the same time extremely self-conscious of her own um, time in place. Uh, and so I want to end by drawing your, uh, by kind of uh, on a reflection on another individual which I have ex much admiration for, um, who, uh, who for over three decades was the, uh, almost like a lone voice, um, uh, I would say, um, in the New York Times, writing, uh, observing, asking very simple fundamental questions about architecture and the city. Um, and, uh, so with that, I would like to conclude on this and introduce um, Thomas, who will, in a uh, very intriguing manner, be having a conversation with Corinne Chan. Um, let me have a quick let me quickly introduce Corinne, who is also in the bulletin. Corinne Chan, many of you will uh, be not unfamiliar with her. She is the current vice president of the Hong Kong Institute of Architects, and she also um, went to Columbia for her graduate school and practiced in New York and Hawaii before returning to Hong Kong to practice and then to set up her own architectural office um, called Axis of Spin. Um, Corinne has contributed to many architectural forums, exhibitions, publications, com competitions, and community projects in, uh, in which she will also talk about and uh, most significantly, she also is one of the co-founders of the Hong Kong Architecture Center. Um, Thomas Chung, who is going to be her discussant and interlocutor, is associate professor of the School of Architecture at CUHK and the chief editor of the Hong Kong Institute of Architects Journal. Without further ado, Thomas. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Eunice and Shirley, for inviting me uh, to this you know, really great occasion. Um, I, looking at the, actually the uh, schedule, uh, all the kind of senior architect pr practitioners um, coming after me, I feel a little bit uh, unqualified, but I'll, I'll try uh, my best. Um, um, and um, I hope, uh, yes, it won't be a kind of phantom conversation. I don't know how to do that. I will maybe just introduce a little bit um, what Corinne will be saying, because we've actually been through the conversation a few times, and um, Eunice and her team actually condensed the video down a lot as well. Um, so, um, Corinne uh, Chan, uh, I uh, personally got to know her um, maybe over 10, year, 10 or 12 years ago um, when I came back to Hong Kong and got involved in the Hong Kong Architecture Center, and very soon, um, after I got to know her, you know, it, she's a really uh, fun-loving person with many or, or too many great ideas, as some of her colleagues would say, um, but very passionate about opening the profession uh, and um, communicating architecture to the wider audience, especially in Hong Kong. And um, at the same time, she has this amazing kindness, gentleness, and empathy to listen to, to everyone. You know, she's with and doing activities with, uh, and being very inclusive, uh, listening, uh, you know, getting opinions from um, all the different parties in all sorts of ways, helping especially the younger generation of Hong Kong architects, uh, perhaps, you know, from her own experience, and spreading the message of architecture in Hong Kong through different media and uh, platforms. So um, you'll actually see three short kind of video session sections uh, the first one will be Corinne actually talking about her formative years and education and probably, you know, we understand a little bit better why she's um, doing, she has done some of the activities and projects later on. And then her own practice, kind of very alternative design practice. Um, and the last session being uh, kind of going beyond uh, purely conventional architectural practice and then, you know, mediating, you know, being the mediator 
um, to spread the, the architecture message of Hong Kong to, to the wider audience in different ways. And I guess, yeah, we could, we could start with the first one, Corinne, uh, talking about her, how she also broke boundaries. I think it's a great uh, To me, connection. life is really a journey of discovery and also the break, breaking down of boundaries. I thought it was great connection with um, you know Eunice's last quote from uh, you know, Edo Huxtable, um, the breaking of rules, breaking breaking of boundaries, and breaking down. I think it started uh, when I uh, went to Canada to Pearson College. It was the first time to enter into a real cultural and also spatial shock, but. This breakdown was also the journey of new discoveries. It was a combination of everything, like a balance between science and art. And one thing very important in the IB program is uh, there's always an emphasis on surface, doing surface to people. After Pearson, then I uh, entered into University of Hong Kong, Department of Architecture. I always, I think, challenge the, the authority or challenge the boundary. So my marks were very extreme from A to F, especially my thesis. The theme of my thesis was uh, restructuring Statue Square. And it was beyond just doing a piece of architecture or a building. It was actually an urban design. Architecture is an attitude. I was the rethinking about the whole urban space and what attitude in this design or what message of this design will bring out. So after Hong Kong U, I graduated, I started to work. And after some years, I have got all my license, even, you know, driver's license. At that moment, another bottleneck. And I felt I need to break out of this cocoon. And so I chose to go to Colombia to further my studies. Uh, for a master degree in urban design. So it was a desire to go beyond just, you know, building, but it has a bigger relationship, you know, to the city, uh, to also other, other parts of, I would say, non-architecture elements. And uh, being at Columbia was another major breakdown. Uh, it was completely different from Hong Kong U and uh, the projects were not about buildings. Everything you had to start from your search. It was so difficult. Uh, but it was the journey to look into every context. And even though there's no site, no program, but when you plunge into it, the program will reveal, you know, by itself. And that was my discovery at Columbia. Okay, so that was the first section about her formative years. Then we go on to her practice, which is called, she's called uh, Axis of Spin. I always was intrigued by this uh, name because of, you know, in the UK you, you associate spin with politics and, uh, and you know, you get dizzy uh, hearing all that spin, as it were. But I find, you know, you'll find out why. Uh, and she's actually find, trying to find that axis, find that anchor and ground um, for you know, for architecture as well as a kind of way of um, being and living in the city. And after Columbia, I worked in New York and also Hawaii. And then before 1997, I made a major decision. That is, I came back to Hong Kong. Why I came back to Hong Kong? I feel there is a deeper connection between me and this city. I feel there is a responsibility of coming back here to serve. And uh, so I came back and I worked. But after some years, another bottleneck. You, you, you really can feel it that you need to break through another layer, you know, another boundary. So at that time, I decided to uh, set up my office that is called Axis of Spin Architecture. Everything's been with an axis. And, and you know, architectures work like crazy. And we spin <laughs> like this. And uh, in this craziness, we need some principle, we need some axis. And this is a reminder to myself that my axis, my principles are integrity, 
pursuance for excellence, partnership, contribution to people and environment. All this year, they are my guidance. Our office still have very interesting projects, I have to say. And I would say there are mainly three types of projects. Uh, the early times was more related to art. So it was uh, art installation, stage set design, uh, a lot of interiors. And then the second, the second type of project is more related to the community. And the third one is more related to the environment. The first one, like uh, I have been doing this kind of uh, art installations or stage set design when I was in New York. That was inspired by uh, Dylan Scofidio. Uh, because at Columbia, I had to do a paper on them. That broke my perception of what architecture should be. I also did uh, stage set design for dance performance and art installation, one, two of them, or actually I should say three of them. Uh, that's called, one called Home and another one called Monument for the Unknown. And the third one is Twin Moon, uh, is an off spin. All these projects are important to me. They're not buildings, but they are space for me to think. They are space for me to rethink about what is monument for an unknown. What do I want to remember? And what's the message that I want to bring out? Or what's the story I want to tell? And uh, so this, this kind of projects are really important to me. After that stage of my work, then we started to have some more interior related projects, but they're all related to the community. Like uh, our clients, like uh, Ring Lily, Dongwa Sam Yun. So these are the projects that we are working on. Always with a question. For a community center, it should be for some special people, mentally challenging, you know, people. But can it be just a normal space that you don't feel like you are special? So our concept was designing a cha tan he. And uh, so you feel like you're just normal, you know, going to a community center. You're not helped, but you're part of the community. And then there was another project called Bijas. And Bijas is a vegetarian restaurant. But we want to do it another way, not doing a zai po, regular, you know, just vegetarian. But we want to present a new uh, image. Being vegetarian can be leading, can be bringing change to the world. In it, the design also embodies the community and also the art elements into it. And the third part of my projects grew into bigger, you know, uh, scale. And the last project I want to mention is uh, Provista Innovation Center is a project in China. It's just building of factories. Some of them can be very typical. So we talk to the client and we develop together with the client the concept that uh, it's a celebration of people and also it's a center for innovation instead of a center only for production. So the, the whole concept is based on a garden. The center garden is based on nature and the nature flows into the building and also forms the form of the building. Yes, so this part, yes, about her practice and there are three points I think interesting. She always, you know, you can see her practice um, compared to ho conventional Hong Kong firms, you know, very alternative projects. She always says projects are, you know, thinking of space as well as providing a space for thinking. And the, the, the other uh, thing about service to community, right? The whole of the projects are about uh, making a care, uh, caring for the environment, but, but also for people. And um, you, you'll see um, in the next session um, how she, her early work, like installations and stage sets, you know, she encouraged, you know, if you like, the younger generations to do through her own curation and, and stuff. And one classic uh, kind of phrase she uses is uh, architecture is the building of relationships. And I think it's really true. She really acts out all that uh, in her projects and also in the way she carries or co-founded the Hong Kong Architecture Center and was a chair lady uh, and initiated many new things. So, Architectures like to travel. So we travel and saw 
many great pieces of architecture, and we came back. And I, there was an urge to share the discoveries. So I started to try it myself. And as a beginning, we wrote articles every week for a newspaper on architecture. And it grew for about more than an, a year that we kept writing, you know, for a newspaper. And afterwards, we uh, collected all these artic articles and uh, developed into a book. And that book was called Ginjoksi the Ginjoksi. It means the seeing, the feeling, and the uh, thinking of an architect. And that really tells us about the essence, you know, of being an architect. So that was the first book, and that, that's the beginning. And then it never ended. We started, that then we followed with uh, several other books, like uh, The Story of Space, uh, Passion for Architecture, 2021 and the big city and the passion of uh, passion for architecture is a book for our senior architects we interviewed 15 of them the project was um, a wake-up call uh, because of Tao Tao Ho Dr. Tao Ho he had uh, a stroke when he was in China and at that time we realized that wow architects work so hard and suddenly they just disappear without any record. So we um, think it's really important that we do an oral history for them. And then later on, this turned into a book. And the story of uh, space is, an, is a book about Hong Kong architecture. You know, after 1997, we, this layer, you know, this group of architects started to think about our identity, our own history. So we dig into it and then we publish this book. Besides uh, book publications, we, uh, I, I started to enter into curation of exhibitions. That these are also accidents uh, because the Institute, Hong Kong Institute of Architects, wanted to do an exhibition for the artworks of Hong Kong architects. But that's just showing the surface. Maybe we can use this exhibition to review something that is deeper. Without art, like you said, without art, there's only building, but not architecture. So that was the beginning of Review One exhibition, and it was so well received by our architects and also the public that we had Review Two. And because of Review Two, uh, Review Two actually had a different uh, perspective. It was called for the community, for the city. So it was not just about our own artwork but also relating to the community. Because in review one, we had um, the center of the exhibition is called the drawing room. And in the middle of it is a large table where events happen, where communications happen, where connection with the public happened. And all these exhibitions are actually platforms for us to investigate, for us to experiment. And also a very great nurturing ground for our young architects. And at the same time, they're bridges with the, with the public because every exhibition, we require them to be interactive. Instead of just a one-way message, like I show you my model, I show you my drawings, that the public don't really understand. <laughs> and what other means can we let the public understand? So the means can be very creative. We use food, we use a dress, we use um, a big chessboard on the floor that talks about Hong Kong historical architecture. I really see this exhibitions are uh, uh, great grants of discoveries. So after our project called the 100 Years of Hong Kong Architecture, at that time we started to have uh, talks and walks and exhibitions for the public. And we really felt the reception was uh, really great and uh, we had a you know face-to-face -face dialogue with the public and then this idea grew into the establishment of Hong Kong Architecture Center so that the public has a deeper understanding into what architecture is and also have a deeper understanding about our profession and I was at that time the co-founder I mean one of the founding members 
And then uh, I was privileged to be his uh, chair lady from 2015 to 2019. And all these years, uh, we have also broken some boundaries. Like uh, usually we did talks, uh, walks. Walks is important because we keep telling the public architecture cannot be read, cannot be seen just in the video. You have to experience it. It's called experiencing architecture. And beyond this, we also had uh, a newspaper column that we regularly write every week and also a radio program. That was like an accident. We were only I was only going up for an interview. And then the host, Audrey, asked me a question. And she said, we talk about Hong Kong architecture. It's the bridge between architecture and also the public. But how do you connect? How do you communicate? And the circle of influence was very small. And uh, that was a good question. So I replied and I said, oh, what about if we have a radio program? That will be great. And one week later, Audrey really called me and said, are you interested uh, to co-host this program called Ginjuk Choi Yi Mun? So it's a weekly program. Every Friday afternoon, we talk about architecture. And we invite a lot of architects to come up and share the stories behind, you know, with the public. Uh, also, at the some years ago, six years ago, we had this Sakjuk uh, Hong Kong, that is uh, public voting for the 10 most like Hong Kong architecture. We name it 10 most like, not the 10 best, not the 10 biggest, not the 10 grandest, but the 10 most like. Uh, we want to present to the public that architecture is not just a physical relationship you have with it. There's also the emotional relationship with architecture. And they started to be amazed and say, wow, in Hong Kong, we have this many, you know, good architecture. And so they started the, the voting. And this is also the beginning of investigating into new ways of uh, enhancing the awareness to our own architecture, to our, our own environment. No matter what one does, can be a installation, can be an interior, can be a urban design, can be a big project. But I think the intention and the essence behind is aligned. Um, uh, originally, according to schedule, we were having a discussion, but I think um, it will make sense uh, because lunch is uh, knocking on the door to actually open it so we can have a three-way conversation. Um, so perhaps we can invite some questions from the audience. If, if, if not, I can actually first start so we can uh, kind of see where this leads. And we have five, ten minutes. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to first say that um, all our interlocutors are not ac in, uh, accidental. They are very, um, uh, there's always something that resonates. And you will see as we go for the rest of the day that whoever is sitting on the this chair or that one, there is actually a lot of synergies between uh, the thinking, the practices, or the collaboration. And in this case, maybe I'll start with um, asking uh, Thomas um, the nature of the collaboration with Corinne and uh, what kind of uh, what have you been learning from each other? Yeah. Okay, well, it's, it's more like me me learning from her. Uh, I was just thinking back to all the collaborations. Um, the way Corinne works, I think uh, maybe others, you know, know her better would have other. Is, is she always includes, um, you know, the whole group, um, and in different stages, maybe she would bring in different people. And f for example, um, you know, her books that all come out from trips or oral history interviews, and then gathered together, and then you see it's always a group of authors, editors. And um, she'd, she'd be one of the leading, but she would never kind of, you know, uh, take over or be, be the dominant um, person. Uh, same with the exhibitions, I think. Um, I remember, uh, you know, kind of brainstorming with her and others about the, the title for review, the, the exhibition, and how that uh, relates also to an architectural element of the window, you know, opening, physically opening and revealing, uh, and also, you know, titles like Play to Change, 
and how the whole thing works uh, with different groups of younger architects, I think some of them, you are here, um, being given a stage to play, but also you know, be, have, have the responsibility to try and make a change. Um, and yeah, so that's the, um, I feel, and I've always been involved in the more, if you like, conceptual uh, early stages, because in the later stages, you know, the others would take over. Um, but one thing I noticed, actually, um, you know, listening this morning um, to uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Giselle um, as well, the, the themes of, you know, um, uh, what was it? you know, expanding the architectural field and, and so on. Uh, the the words that Corinne's um, uh, the titles of her exhibition reveal, play, and change somehow is kind of striking, you know, resonating with me, is a kind of alternative practice, a challenge to, you know, the kind of conventional establishment. Um, and you can see it in her, the projects she can do, or maybe it's the only kind of projects she can do. And I think uh, maybe the, the you know, later sessions can speak to that. Uh, and also her own character pushes her also to, to do this inside out thing, which I think, you know, compared to, um, um, sorry, Julia, who's kind of doing the outside in. Um, I think it's, you know, lots to think about. Um, should, should I continue? <laughs> Maybe, Maybe yes. Yeah, I so. can make a quick reflection uh, to round it uh, up. Um, also, uh, it's interesting that when uh, Thomas first uh, said, he pointed out that, how come you make the youngest panel go first? You know, <laughs> like, uh, I mean, in terms of the next three sessions, um, because in uh, the um, the rest of the participants today, who are all architects um, in Hong Kong, Corinne is con uh, comparatively the junior one. And if you remember the last slide where um, John Lin, uh, who will be the last speaker for today, um, in our conversation with Corinne, Corinne had said that John is one of um, the, the mentor figure in her uh, architectural training and someone she looked up to. So um, also the question of mentorship, and it's not necessarily gendered. Uh, it's also one referring to the question of absences. Um, so when you actually start to look at who are the mentors uh, in the whole architectural uh, uh, profession or education, and I'm very touched by your sharing of Manette, because um, that actually it's interesting that in the writing of history, which produces this um, lack of, so always, invariably, it doesn't matter what gender it is, most of us, I say in the collective, um, refers to Corbusier as the kind of, uh, you know, not mentor in necessary that we know them, but as the kind of uh, invocative figure in which, you know, you relate to uh, his ideas. Um, you think about, but through these uh, conversations, and I'm very confident that uh, more will come this afternoon, you start to see um, the deferring and the range of roles of mentorship in architectural uh, education and practice. For Julia, for example, in my conversation with her, she said that she came from someone who knew absolutely nothing uh, about architecture and not even thinking about it, to uh, being mentor in a way, to, and to be talking to architects that have since become kind of icons of their field. And that in itself uh, was kind of uh, an experience that uh, is a life experience, I would say. So anyway. Um, I think uh, maybe final point on Corinne, back to Corinne is, uh, um, I just realized, you know, the way she's doing all these oral history projects, even the competition, the, the word competition is not, doesn't sound well with the established practices. Competition for the most liked architecture is like she and the groups trying to get the public to rewrite or, or for their own, for, for themselves, for Hong Kong, post handover Hong Kong, you know, the crisis of identity and so on. Uh, to do, do it in a very fun loving and enthusiastic way, the, the kind of writing of the, this history uh, of architecture in the city. And, um, Final ending, I, th I was told by Corinne to say this. Um, her final uh, contribution would be to say that um, fire has no gender, so the, the fire of uh, creativity. Great, thank you. Um, <laughs> that's a good way to end, really. 
And I also have great news for, um, please do stay for the, um, I think you'll be in more invigorating conversations and sharing. Um, the good news is that there's lunch for everybody, every single person here and in the corridor and behind, as well as tea and coffee. Um, and we will c reconvene at, uh, uh, what is it? 2.30, and um, for session three on negotiating, building, preserving, serving the public. <laughs>